This is our story, a universal story and one that we all share. An understanding that we are not separate from each other or from our biosphere. When the first astronauts looked back on the Earth and saw the blue planet and saw how beautiful and alive it was, it was a transforming experience. That experience gave us the understanding that we live in one biosphere. We are part of its evolution. It's our home. Biosphere 2 was called Biosphere 2 after Earth's Biosphere 1 because it was a man-made, contained, closed system that was trying to recreate the global ecology of Earth's systems. So this man-made world had all the living uh, components necessary to be another biosphere. It was extremely complex, very biodiverse. That was a closed system, meaning nothing was, could go in and out of this system from our Earth's biosphere except information. So it was materially sealed off as a laboratory to study Earth's ecology. From September 1991 to September 93, eight of us from United Kingdom, Belgium, and the USA embarked on a mission to live inside that biosphere with microbes, plants, fungi, and animals. We knew how Biosphere 2 was designed, where its boundaries reached, how finite its resources were, and in what ways our daily actions impacted this miniature world. In time, we learned how to live with this evolving system and become stewards of its well-being. This experience brought a shift in consciousness, similar to the ones the astronauts experienced. We became part of this unique, man-made biosphere. Our health and well-being was synonymous with the health of Biosphere 2. Five years ago, when I first heard of the word Biosphere 2, I was a doctoral student at Yale University and the closest thing to Biosphere 2 is a Biosphere Reserve. And now today, it's actualized here in the glory of the Blue Catalina Mountains. I've been so lucky in my life, somehow to be at the right place at the right time. And I happened to meet the founder of, of Biosphere 2 in Sri Lanka when I was, was there as a graduate student. And when I first heard about Biosphere 2, I thought, what? I don't even know. I have no idea what you're talking about, except the concept of building a laboratory biosphere was so fascinating and had everything to do with who I was in my life that I was deeply fascinated and said, um, well, I'd like to help. This is a day I've been wishing for a long time. And I know all of you have been wishing for this. I remember four years ago, we had a big hole in the ground. Since, we poured 15,000 cubic yards of concrete, 640 tons of stainless steel, over 70,000 struts. Some days where we had 400 people working, over, under, crawling throughout the biosphere. We brought in marsh plants from Florida, coral from Yucatan. This experience of, of constructing the biosphere has been a lifetime by itself. Now I can't wait to go inside and operate the biosphere and see and find out what keeps me alive. Well, I think I was introduced in the technosphere on a very, at, at a very early age. My father was a, an amazing technician. He took care of his own building. He had a huge workshop. 
And as a kid, that's the places where I would hang out. But in our, in our family at home, after evening dinner, the table would be cleared and whatever was broken, either it be from a neighbor or from friends, a television set would be put on the table and my dad would start taking this apart. Sometimes, you know, on the, on the side of the table there will be a bunch of blenders and radios and TVs, things like that, that then he would take apart and fix. And as a little kid, I would, I would be sitting there watching everything he was doing and, and slowly, slowly start learning all of those things. Together over the next two years, we will come to a better understanding of what it means to be a biospherian living in and looking after a biosphere, whether it's biosphere one or biosphere two. The very first time that I ever heard about biosphere two, it was shown to me on the back of a piece of paper. It was this little sketch that had been done, which was the very first idea, the very first design that the architect had had of what it might look like. And it was described to me kind of very briefly as this completely enclosed system and containing all the biomes. And um, it was going to be a tool for the study of the ecology of the planet. And it was going to be an experiment to see if we could take life systems into space. And the minute I heard about this project, I knew in every bone, every cell of my body, that this was the project for me. Biosphere 2 pronounced that or really shone the spotlight on living in a biosphere by trying to create a enclosure that has everything in it to sustain life, including humans. And then, of course, then the question becomes what keeps us alive? And then, of course, the only other biosphere we know is Biosphere 1. So we had to study very carefully how Biosphere 1 worked. So ocean systems, marsh systems, uh, the desert. Is the desert important? Is the savanna important? Is the rainforest important? Obviously, we know that agriculture is important because that's where we get our food from. That's how we live. Uh, in the habitat, our little city, What's important for a human? We used to um, sit around sometimes at dinners at the end of a very long day and just brainstorm about the most common of sense things. Okay, we're going to live in there two years. What do we want to eat? Where's our water coming from? I mean, I mean, this was all going on during the day too. Very busy science and engineering and everybody else, construction, all busy about going about how to figure all this out. But, you know, for the participants who are actually going to be living in there, to really put yourself in that question, well, how am I, what water am I willing to drink? And what food do I really want to eat for two years? And what am I going to be able to do in my leisure time? What's available to me? So it wasn't just like someone else was building Biosphere 2 and then we all walked in there. No, 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 no. We were, all of us engaged with some aspect of the Biosphere in great detail. In my case, it was the marine systems and research in general. And we were engaged on a very personal level, very, very uh, contemplative personal level. I loved it that we called the agriculture the agriculture biome and not just the farm as separate from all the other biomes. And we called our habitat the, 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 the human biome, the habitat biome. And it was all part of one big, incredible picture. At some point, I remember uh, we were building the space frame and the space frame we had we used because it could span really large areas with glass that would let the sunlight through to grow of our trees so but we couldn't quite complete the space frame until we craned in the uh, trees so at one point you could come to biosphere 2 and and you see the crane move gigantic pieces of space frame in place there would be uh, back holes filling different types of soil I think Biosphere used something of 27 different types of soil in different soil layers to make sure that these plants would use the nutrients, the minerals that all, or the properties that all these different soils have. Uh, rainforest was totally different than the desert. The desert alone had like 
14 or 15 different types of soil. So developing the soils for the biosphere was um, really, really part, part of the job that I worked on before we went in and thinking about how they would be like really nutritious and, and you know how we would keep the plants growing and you know and I you know I'd come really from the world of food production you know and that let's throw the goodies in there and make sure everything gets recycled and we had the most perfect nutritional recycling system in that everything at some point went back into the soil and by the time it was finished in 91 already the biomes were take, taking form and you could begin to see how they were going to look they were starting to mature and so what we moved into in 1991 was a very very beautiful thing it was a very beautiful space all of our thinking had to be new. All of the materials that we used inside Biosphere 2 had to be non-toxic for life. Anything that went in there, so for, for example, we couldn't use plywood because plywood used certain glues that would outgas and would harm life, ourselves. Um, there's all kinds of paints that we could not use. It's, in fact, it's very hard to find a paint that is not harm, harmful to life, but will protect steel, for example, things like that. Biosphere 2 was, was pioneering that. We used our desks, our desks were made out of sandstone, natural stone. Tables were made out of different stone. Uh, the coverings on the walls were made out of natural wool because natural wool wouldn't outgas, it would be all part of the biosphere. When we were building the biosphere and we brought the coral reef in, we started to bring it in from the Caribbean and the space frame wasn't yet on, and Tucson, the big city just near where, or where Biosphere 2 was being built, was only about oh, 40 minutes away by car. Um, but I'd never thought about acid rain coming from the city. And it rained one afternoon, like kapow. And I went out to check on the ocean and <gasps> in the matter of minutes, that acid rain, which was full of um, pollution, nutrients, whatnot, had come into this artificial ocean biome with real living reef. I mean, artificial in that it was made in Arizona. It, doesn't, it wasn't on the natural seacoast, but fully alive, turned pea green because all of the um, algae, microalgae, microfauna flora algae, had taken up this extra nutrients and just mass produced. And it was so fast. It's small enough that ch things happen fast. Like it's not like the, if that had happened in the, the rain from Tucson had, had rained in the big ocean, you wouldn't see that because it's so big. But because it's so small, you can see immediate changes. So we had a very extensive basement underneath the uh, biosphere, underneath the living systems, which we called the technosphere. And the technosphere was in service of the biosphere. We had 2000 sensor points. Uh, we had 120 pumps recycling 4 million liters of salt water, 200,000 liters of fresh water. Um, the condensate was collected there for our drinking water. The air handlers uh, alone could move 600 cubic meters per minute. So it was an extensive uh, network of pipes and tanks that would be in service of the biosphere. None of that technical equipment like air handlers could harm the biosphere, could harm the living systems. So all the materials that we used, all the protection around the equipment had to be all in service of the biosphere. So I had my own workshop inside the biosphere because of course we couldn't bring anything inside once we closed the door. So I had spare parts, I had materials, I had a lathe in there, milling machine, even welding and soldering equipment for any of the repairs, any of the maintenance that needed to be done, or, or even if we needed to build something new that we haven't thought of yet. Once we had these live systems arrived in Biosphere 2 and started interacting with the Technosphere systems, uh, which was amazing to see. Suddenly you saw uh, the trees in the breeze and the wind, which was actually generated by a gigantic air handler. 
you could see, hey, wow, this, this air handler now is creating the breeze to, for example, just a tree without wind doesn't, doesn't have a certain hormone and doesn't get very strong. Uh, they, they experience this a lot in greenhouses. So suddenly, technology here was helping this tree become strong and, and alive. It was such an ecstatic moment to get into the airlock and hear the door close and then have the next door open and to walk into what I knew well. I knew Bias for Two by that time. We'd been building it for years. I was familiar with it. We had done a lot of experiments in there. I'd lived in there, but now this was the two-year beginning. And it was like those moments when you feel all eternity in it, just timelessness of, wow, here I am. Everyone who was involved with the Bice for Two project were very unusual people. Eight people, vastly different ages, four men, four women. What a feat, different places around the world, that we came together, each of us wanted to, each of us wanted to be inside, and we did it. We didn't leave. No matter how difficult, no matter how food, sh food shortages, or in some cases we had a decline in oxygen due to a cement interaction that was going on with our infrastructure, and some people really didn't feel well by that. It was like climbing very high in the mountains and getting altitude sickness, missing friends and loved ones. Whatever the challenge on a personal level that all of these eight people went through, they all stayed and they all tried their best. The crew were incredible and we were dedicated to the proposition that we were going to make this work. If I could have chosen the other seven people to go live with me inside the biosphere, I don't think that would have made a difference actually in the end. What matters is that you all decide to make it happen. It takes as much um, research and attention to relations as it does to technical systems, as it does to natural systems. The energy that was activated to a calling uh, happened, and that's the reason for the relationship. If man was separate, then when the door closed on September 26, 1991, our paths would have diverged. I would have carried out my life. I would have adapted to whatever I was adapting to and gone my way, and vice versa too would have done its and gone its way. But we didn't do that. We changed and moved through time with this biosphere, and we changed with it.
So we were becoming our biosphere. We were wearing the health of our biosphere too. I'd worked with forests a lot before I went inside Biosphere 2 and I've worked a lot with forests since, but it was only in Biosphere 2 that I really became fully aware of the fact of what those forests, what those trees, what those plants were providing for me. That they, they were literally there providing the oxygen that I was breathing and there was that incredible reciprocal connection between the human and the plant world. I mean, I probably instinctively known it before, but it, it was so self-evident inside Biosphere 2. It, it was so present the whole time that we were in there. And that was, that was one of the great things about Biosphere 2 for me. With drinking water, the water molecules were now very much we understood before going in. It was part of our atmosphere, it was going to be part of us, it was going to be part of the biosphere, and we were going to remove it eventually from the atmosphere for drinking water. Water would get into the biosphere cycles if it remained a form of water, and it would, if it got polluted, it would pollute everything. So it would pollute eventually the ocean, it would eventually pollute the, uh, all the wilderness biomes, it would pollute the agriculture, and thus it would pollute us. It would pollute the farm animals. So we were very aware that we had to be extremely careful with what we did with our water, what we did with our gardens, what we put on our gardens, that no pesticides that were harmful got on the gardens. Uh, in any way, were we going to allow our little biosphere, which was all going to come through us at one point, uh, be polluted? And that was an enormous teaching. We had to grow all of our food in that case, so we could only eat what we grew. And that was an immediate feedback right there. I had my heart in my mouth when I went in there as the person responsible for feeding that crew. Because, you know, already our research has shown that it was going to be tight. And also we had no idea that we were going to face um, two very, very dull years in terms of the weather uh, in Biosphere 2. We had very low sunlight, especially for the first year. And the entire system was driven by sunlight. And plants will only grow when they have so much sunlight and they'll only produce well when they have so much sunlight. So with the very low light levels that we had, we were already on the edge of a plant's productive capability. So it was truly a challenge to get enough food out of the ground. So we often had to put up with some very strange meals, you know, <laughs> and very often we had to eat a lot of what was available. In fact, we lived and ate how people used to live and eat. Biospheric view would be a view that would show all the connections. It would show the connections to the land, it would show the connections to the people, it would show the connections to the air, it would show the connection to the animals that are on that land, to the birds. It would show that if you did one thing here, it will have an effect further down the line. You know, one of the things we talk about when we talk about Biosphere 2 all the time is the rapid feedback system in Biosphere 2. And we illustrate it in many ways for, you know, how we couldn't use pesticides or any dangerous chemicals because they were going to come right back to us in our food system and right back to us in our atmosphere or in our water. To give you an example of uh, how Biosphere 2 cycled in the matter of days to weeks versus thousands of years, our Biosphere Earth is cycling. If um, I were to boil a cup of tea and, and the, our water comes from condensing water from the atmosphere. So I boil a cup of tea, I drink the tea, it leaves me and then it goes into our uh, waste recycling system and then it would be 
use for irrigation water. Um, by the time that molecule has been taken out of the air and gone through me and back into the soil, it will be coming, possibly returning to the atmosphere in the matter of days to weeks. Basically in the command room where we are now, this is the hub of information. This is where all the thousands of sensors that are placed throughout the biosphere, whether it be the soil or the water or the air, feed in information to this room, to the computer systems here. This is a CO2 average, CO2 max, that's carbon dioxide maximum and minimum levels for the day. During the first year, we immediately saw the oxygen in the atmosphere started to fall, which is very surprising and something unexpected. But the wonderful thing about it was it showed that we had such a tight system that we were able to monitor oxygen. The Earth's atmosphere right now is 400 ppm. It's been rising steadily since Biosphere 2. Back in the Biosphere 2 days, it was about 360. But for us, we are now getting up to over 4,000 in certain periods of time. And in a day, we'd be over 1,000. And this had a huge impact on the coral reef because rising CO2 dissolves into the ocean make, and makes it fall in alkalinity. So we were experiencing that in Biosphere 2. And to try and control our carbon dioxide, we had to do, we participated in the dynamic um, management of our biosphere's atmosphere we became active participants and we stopped compost because compost oh, through the action of the decomposition creates more carbon dioxide. We cooled down our biosphere and we brought it down many degrees to slow down respiration. So this was our first hand experience that we could do that. The eight biospherians inside could use their intelligence working scientifically as well as with common sense. And this is extremely important because this is what we need to do today. As a planetary people, we need to get together and take seriously this rise of carbon dioxide and put our thought together, okay, well, let's stop doing that. You know, what do you do? We had a million gallon ocean with those waves with an entire coral reef that came from uh, southern Mexico, from Yucatan, it was striving inside Biosphere 2. It had o over 80 baby uh, coral colonies in there that were new colonies. So what we discovered, and Gay was in the ocean every day, what she discovered was that whatever happened to the atmosphere, the reflection of the coral would either be brighter or less bright. So color reflection was an immediate direction to what was going on in the atmosphere. Together with Phil Dustin, we made a system inside through he through the video because it was our closed systems. With the camera, we started to look at the health of the corals. But for us, what was amazing was, hey, you could actually look at the health of your biosphere by looking at the corals. Biosphere Foundation was founded inside Biosphere 2 with the idea of if our coral is healthy, our biosphere is healthy, well, let's go take a look at the health of our corals in Biosphere 1. In Biosphere 2, even though it rose to 4,000, above 4,000 ppm, the coral reef was large enough, diverse enough, it had enough um, different life pathways rich biodiversity that it withstood a, a fall in pH that was beyond any small aquarium tank. Scientists would have predicted if the coral reef had dropped in that pH, it wouldn't have survived, and ours did, and it did because it was healthy and biodiverse. So the biggest teaching for climate change, for global warming, at least for the coral reef and really all natural ecosystems, is protect its biodiversity. Google is funding this gigantic, is funding Kurzweil, is really pushing artificial intelligence, which I think is, is a fantastic thing to do. But what I, and I can't wait for it, for an artificial intelligent robot to come out, because what that robot will do is do all the simple things. It will immediately start planting trees all around the planet. Because you plant one tree, you stop erosion, you're creating, uh, you're taking up CO2, you fabricating oxygen, etc., etc., etc. Somehow you see we're still cutting down rainforest. If we had artificial intelligence, 
they would say no more stock cutting down of rainforest, no more using uh, single use plastic and plastic bags, etc., and cups and so on and so forth. So all these actions are very simple, but they have enormous effects. Joseph Campbell, we, we had his uh, videotapes inside Biosphere 2. Um, he had a whole story about myth and the hero's journey. And we felt very akin to this mythology of the hero's journey because we weren't making an analogy that we were heroes. We were making the analogy to the myth that we were, and his myth says first it starts with a calling. You're called to the task. And the task was to design Biosphere 2 and live in it and be part of it. And we did, we all rose to the occasion and did that. And then um, there's challenges and hills and dales along the way. And you sort of go through life. And then when you come out, you have this, uh, the next stage, the third stage of the hero's journey is you need to integrate back into your previous life. And so my life's journey since has been really following this, third stage of Joseph Campbell's journey, which is very true, um, how to integrate what I know back into this biosphere, to people I love, to people I meet, to people I care about, to people I'm working with. When Gay and Laser and I came out of the biosphere, um, we'd started the Biosphere Foundation and we worked mostly, of course, they, um, Gay and Laser worked with the ocean systems and myself with the forest. but. We've always had this dream that one day we would establish a project that was looking again at the entire biosphere, both by land and by sea, to provide a centre where people could come and contribute and learn and give to this and, and take away from it. And Bali seems to us to be probably a very good place where we might be able to do that. There, there is an atmosphere of tolerance here and of, um, there's a magic to this island where you have a feeling that actually just about anything could happen. It feels like a place that that kind of a dream could come true. They are still in touch with their biosphere. They are still in touch with their land. They're in touch with their ocean. There is that awareness of resources. In Biosphere 2, we knew where the boundaries of our biosphere was. We could walk them. We knew where all the pumps were that we're recycling our air and our water. And we could see how the two came together, how technology and ecology were absolutely integrated and without both in this little miniature artificial man-made world, we wouldn't be alive and well. How does ecology clean up its water looking at marshes, capture that example and then recreate it to a place where it's needed. For example, like right here in Tifti Ganga. So wastewater gardens for me was a real hands-on tool of taking technology and ecology and putting the two together and coming up with beautiful gardens that was treating the waste and making the water beneficial, in the case of Tifti Ganga, for the farmers. Wherever I go, wherever I end up living, whichever farmers I end up working with, I want to know what we can get out of the ground. And what we can get out of the ground and how much we can get out of the ground and how diverse a, a crop 
selection we can get out of the ground? How can we do it with the natural resources that are, are available to us? And I'm extremely lucky to have been able to live that as part of my life ever since. It's an, a never-ending journey. It's, it's a never-ending process and a never-ending field of investigation. So I think it's something that will keep me entertained until I die. So in 2008, we came and went to Manjangan and dove on the reef, and we were fascinated by the region of northwest Bali, by the coral reef of Manjangan. In 2011, we came back to do a baseline study of the coral reef and found that it had been damaged in the past by many things, from uh, global warming to dynamite fishing in the past. And but the present damage, the most recent and pressing damage, was the anchors of small boats, both by local and international visitors who would come to the island. And the international people were coming mostly to dive and snorkel, but the local people were coming to pray because Manjangan is a sacred island for Bali. And we immediately started to uh, make friends with the community and especially to Nono and Sutama, who started a mooring buoy program with us to address this problem, both in terms of education, to teach the boat, boat drivers that if they anchor on the reef and continue to damage the reef, then they will no longer have a destination worth, worth vis visitors coming to pay attention to and love. And also to try and maintain these mooring buoys um, that they were now building, to, to put them around the island to keep uh, safe anchorages ready and available for all these boats to put them in and then to maintain them year-round. Already for the, the few years that we've been doing this, putting in a mooring buoy obviously stops people because they prefer to tie off on the mooring rather than to use the anchor. So no more anchors go onto the reef, so the reef is not damaged. Okay, then what happens to a non-damaged reef, it attracts fish that, and it attracts reef fish. Now those reef fish attract pelagic fish, big ocean fish, so on and so forth. Now a beautiful reef also attracts tourists. Now the National Park um, protects this area from development but unfortunately the National Park cannot protect this area from another problem which is invasive species. As human beings have moved all over the biosphere they bring their plants with them and unfortunately sometimes they bring the wrong plants with them and this particular plant is called Lantana camera. It's very very beautiful you can see why the foreigners brought it with them originally it's got a lovely flower but unfortunately it has some properties which make it really dangerous to coastal monsoon forests like this. It has no predators here. When it grows in the forest it creates a thick jungle of impenetrable jungle of its own. So one of the projects that we've been working with with TSS is to see what we can do, if there's anything we can do to solve this problem. This is the place where Biosphere Foundation runs its Biosphere Stewardship programs, where we bring international teenagers from all over the world to meet together here with Balinese teenagers. And we have a 10-day program every summer where we try to introduce the children to the ecology of the area. And we're in a perfect place to do this because we're in the middle of the monsoon forest. We are very close to the ocean, the coral reef, the mangrove, the rainforest. There's even a small savanna. So it's, it's like a miniature biosphere all in one place. And we can bring the teenagers here and we can show them and they can experience all the different ecologies and learn how all the different ecologies operate together and how they're all part of our planetary system. So it's a wonderful place to be able to come. What's happening on Mir 
is all the things that we were doing at Biosphere 2. It's a problem-solving platform. We go to a place, or usually we invite it to a place, to solve problems. Why do people like what we do is because they want to be involved and this boat gives people an opportunity to be involved. To also see and experience that to do your part as a, as a biospherian to, is, you know, it's a very simple but very satisfying thing to do. So everything is moving. Our planet is spinning. Where, and when we're on a boat at sea, the boat's also moving. And this, just this, that people have, get on a boat if they've never been on a boat, and they have to deal with the dawn and the sunset, and where the boat is in relation to it, or winds that'll pick up and all of a sudden you're moving in a different way, or currents, and um, being in touch with nature. That simple thing to get back in touch with our environment is life changing. It's a real, it provides a tremendous possible transformation and aha moment of, oh yeah, I am in the middle of the ocean, on the example of Mir, with the stars overhead that on a night watch are moving um, in, over my gaze, it's in motion. I am on spaceship Earth. I am on, as Bucky Fuller called it, a planet that is a spaceship Earth that is, I'm a part of, it's mine to take care of and love and be responsible for as it is us all. You know, we come from Laser Sierra and I, the Biosphere people, anyone in Biosphere 2 really comes from that background of that perception of knowing that we are, we are completely integrated with our Biosphere and thus this shift of appreciation of seeing that connection will change people's behavior just by seeing it. But it takes that aha moment. It takes that moment just like when the astronauts went to space and they looked back on Earth and they saw that we live in a biosphere. It is a unique system. It is a closed system, just like Biosphere 2. It is our Earth system. We, we are connected. Even when we're in a space shuttle, they were connected to that home base. And that's the most important message for our future is for, to, to keep saying that this is true and bring people to a place that is full of biosphere beauty so they realize, of course, of course that's right. I'm breathing air all the time. I'm drinking water. I'm eating food. I'm, I'm a part of it. <laughs>